subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. Welcome to this Australian Water School webinar. We're so glad you could join us today to discuss modelling with HEC HMS, presented by Thomas Brower, Michael Bartles, Craig Price, Stephen Joins. This is the hydrologic modelling system designed to simulate complete hydrologic processes. Well, let's get on with this. My name's Trevor Filler. I'm the National Partnership Manager here at IceWarm and the webinar chair. Um, but it's been really good to see the response to this webinar today. You can see on the screens there, right today, four presenters. Uh, Thomas Brower, Michael Bartles, Craig Price and Stephen Joins. We are so glad you could join us, gentlemen. Um, you can see a fantastic amount of experience here. Welcome to you all. I want to ask you just one question each before we kick off this off. What drives you to this? What motivates you to, um, to uh, uh, get right into this heck HMS? Maybe we'll start with um, you, Craig. You, you can... <laughs> well, it may be no surprise that I'm more of a hydraulics guy than a hydrology guy, but uh, Steve and I have been uh, team teaching a HMS and heck RAS course once a year in New Zealand, um, which has been a face-to-face -face course. And now we're venturing out doing this on our own uh, with, with IceWarm now as a partner to do it through, through the online system. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, it's been very good to, uh, to be able to do this um, with, uh, you know, and, and to get involved in this. But really, frankly, um, I, I won't uh, try to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. Uh, fr frankly, I, I'm, I use uh, HMS for boundary conditions. So that's what I use it for. So um, uh, I'll, I'll pass along to everybody else. I need the uh, hydrographs uh, to put into my HECRAS models. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I am excited uh, because um, to, we, we use those HECRAS models um, as rainfall runoff models as well. And I am really excited to find out what's new in the upcoming version 4.4. So yep. I don't want to take much more time than that. But so I'll pass it off to the other guys. Cray, you sound like you're you should have the background that I've got in my screen, but you're, <laughs> but you're not in the, uh, the US. <laughs> yes, I was, just, I was just there actually in San Francisco a couple of months ago, actually at yep. the HEC offices. And um, you know, I've, I've been in Australia about 12 years now, and, um, but I do get back to the US occasionally. That's, um, I, I went to Berkeley for my uh, schooling. So just across the bay, I think you might not, actually almost see it from, on the left there. Yes. Not far <laughs> from here, yeah, right. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. And Excellent. All right, Steve, yourself uh, from the beautiful New Zealand? Yeah, hi everybody. This yeah, Steve joins here. Um, been teaching HMS for at least ten years now. I've been using the software for twenty years at least, out of necessity. But over time, it's really interesting to use. It's so simple, and um, to be honest, I think I practically use it every single day of my working life. So I'd like to think I know it inside out, but um, you, you never know everything about software. So it's going to be an interesting thing for me. But um, always happy to answer questions as you need it. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, Cray and Steve will be on the uh, uh, Q&A chat lines for, uh, right through this whole hour. So do write your questions and I'll be answering them. They'll be talking with you about that. Um, right, uh, up to you, Michael. What, what brings you to uh, HEC HMS and uh, this whole area of hydrologic modeling? So um, I really enjoy the big problems, right? So I enjoy working on the models that are hundreds of thousands of square miles or should I say square kilometers? We don't see what the metric system very often here in the US, but I like the very, very large problems. Um, so I've been attracted to them. And that is mostly in the realm of hydrologic modeling, though I do dabble in hydraulic modeling quite a bit yep. as well. Yeah. Yep. And yourself, yeah, for me, yourself um, yeah. I guess for me, I once again, like Mike said, I was always attracted to the big problems, and the Army Corps is, is usually doing the big problems. And you come to a place like HEC and you're doing the hardest of the big problems. And so that's always been uh, fun for me. And I'll say uh, the Venn diagram between computer science and hydrology is kind of the world I operate in. And that's a really fun world for me. It was a, like a combination of my interests. Yep. Well, uh, that's, that's a, a good start. We'll get, we'll get stuck into this now. The way we're going to do this is uh, Craig's going to pick up, uh, going to kick off with a couple of intro um, uh, uh, slides and, and just to talk about the overall picture. Then we're going to hand over to Tom uh, and Michael uh, and um, then we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, Steve will also be uh, on board uh, actively working with the Q&A line. Uh, um, but my background today is really dedicated to you two gentlemen because you're not far from here, I understand. You, you actually live quite close to this. <laughs> That's true. Uh, we work out of the Hydrologic Engineering Center in Davis, California, so we're about mm. two hours east 
of where this picture is taken. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite places in the world actually is where you're <laughs> supposedly standing. Looking back <laughs> yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. Finally, <laughs> yeah, finally. Uh, yeah, no, Adelaide, South Australia. <laughs> Not quite the same, but pretty good place to live though, I can tell you. Okay, no more of this. Let's get stuck into this. Uh, right over to you, Cray. If I've missed anything, let me know. Otherwise, uh, you, you lead us away, Cray. Excellent. Um, first thing is always an IT check. Can you see my screen with the uh, uh, presenters? Fantastic. Excellent. Okay, and I want to keep my remarks as short as we possibly can because we want to dive right into Tom and Michael's uh, comments. Um, what I wanted to do, though, is just uh, kind of introduce where we're at with the Hydrologic Engineering Center. We have had probably six or eight of these webinars um, on uh, HECRAS, so on the Hydrologic Engineering Center, the HEC, and the purists will say HEC instead of HEC. Um, we all, uh, at least on this webinar, there's a lot of people who have sat in on HECRAS um, discussions. Um, we've had over 50,000 views of our um, HECRAS webinars. As of tomorrow, when this one is posted, we'll probably have our first uh, HMS uh, view on YouTube. But I wanted to just um, set the stage for what we're looking at here. Um, HECRAS came from uh, the HEC2 package, a Fortran package, which computed water surface profiles, and uh, some of you may be my age or older and uh, remember that. But there's also HEC3, HEC4, HEC5, HEC6. Um, if you want to learn a little more about those, um, we can. Uh, I'll show you a link here in, in just a minute. But um, what was HEC1? What was the predecessor to this HECRAS? We can answer Cray's question. <laughs> I see where Cray was going with this. So <laughs> the Cray, predecessor yeah. to HMS was actually HEC1. So if anybody's used HEC1, then HEC, HMS, a lot of it will make sense to them. And if not, we'll clarify what HMS is uh, to the world today. So as was introduced earlier, my name's Tom. My name is Mike Bartles. And we are hydraulic engineers from the Hydrologic Engineering Center, as we said, in Davis, California. So HEC is a part of the Army Corps of Engineers uh, within the United States underneath the Department of Defense. So today, thank you all, first and foremost, for joining on. We certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about HEC HMS. And without further ado, let's kick into it. So here's an overview of our presentation. Today, we're gonna to talk about HMS, a little bit of an overview and its various capabilities. We're also gonna talk quickly about the differences between hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, uh, since that was brought up earlier. Then through demonstration, we're gonna show how an HMS model can be created, parameterized, calibrated, and calibrated using observed data quickly. And then finally, we're gonna close with a quick discussion of enhancements that we plan on including within HMS in the future, and then so do some Q&A afterwards. Okay, first let's start with hydrology. So hydrology is the study of water, or more formally, the scientific study of the movement, distribution, and quality of water. We have a nice picture here that I think captures hydrology well. We see precipitation falling from some clouds. We see a land surface that has a potential for infiltration. We see some vegetation with the capacity to transpire water. And we see a lake or river system here that it probably flows downstream to the ocean at some point. So all of this uh, is captured in this picture, and this is hydrology. Now let's take the same thing we just looked at in an image form, and let's look at it in more of a chart. So we, in this chart, we see some hydrologic processes. Well, all of these processes are what we're modeling in HMS. So we think, see things like precipitation. We have methods to model precipitation. We see surface runoff. This is the major thing we're capturing in HMS. We have loss rates that subtract from the, the precipitation excess. We have things like lakes and reservoirs in HMS, rivers, uh, even things like evapotranspiration and evaporation. So a few bullet points on HMS. It's applicable for most regions of the world. It's the way it's designed. It can be, it can and has been applied all around the world. It's both we have, and so for each process, I, I guess one point of distinction that I often come to is people sometimes will say, oh, HMS and call it a model. And there's a point of distinction I like to make is that HMS is actually a program that you do hydrologic modeling in. So with each hydrologic process, we have multiple approaches for modeling that process. And so the end model, the, the result model in HMS is actually, it's nearly always a custom model that the user has built. So we'll talk about things like we have empirical methods and physically based methods for, for each hydrologic process. 
people will talk when they talk modeling, they talk, is it event or continuous? Well, HMS can do either depending on how, which modeling methods you select and how you parameterize it. And then uh, one, another one that comes up, is it gridded or lumped? Those terms fly around in the modeling world and HMS can do either of those. We have gridded methods, we have lumped parameter. I would sometimes, you could, you could call that uh, semi-distributed. So HMS, uh, we have approaches for doing both of those. Some of the strong suits of HMS is data handling. So temporal aggregation and disaggregation, HMS handles all of that automatically. So if you have daily precipitation data and run your model at a six hour time step, HMS handles that. Uh, another thing that HMS does well is handling unit systems. So in the States, we often work in US customary units around the world, it's often metric. And so HMS handles the conversions between those unit systems uh, without automatically, without any input from the user. Uh, and so another beneficial thing about HMS is we have some compute types that are oriented toward hydrologic studies. So the most common of which is a simulation run. We also have an optimization trial where you're able to optimize parameters. We have a forecast alternative that's set up for forecasting. We do depth area analyses, so which are typically paired with a frequency storm for designing hydro hydrologic and hydraulic structures. And then we do an uncertainty analysis where we can start to consider things like parameter uncertainty. So to have a quick discussion about the differences between hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. Um, so in the past, HEC1, HEC2 world, uh, there were very well-defined boundaries between hydrologic models. Now within the HMS and HEC RAS uh, world, that we live in today, those boundaries have started to become a little bit more blurred. Uh, for instance, hydraulic models have started to allow for the simulation of rainfall on the overland plain, as you guys have seen in various other presentations. Also, hydrologic models have started to become uh, capable of including hydraulic routing. Uh, but before choosing a hydrologic model or a hydraulic model for use in a study, you know, it's important to take into account the considerations of the study itself. So that includes things like run times, so for instance, hydrologic models tend to require less time to complete a simulation due to their inherent simplifications, whereas hydraulic models take a bit more time because they're inherently more complicated. The nature of the system, you should also take that into account. For instance, very, very flat channel slopes. So in the US, we usually apply a rule of thumb about two feet per mile. Anything less than that, hydraulic routing tends to be the best choice. Well, it's usually the best choice anyways, but hydrologic routing really starts to fall apart and doesn't do a great job of capturing true attenuation and translation effects of floodways through systems. So if you're dealing with systems like that, you might wanna be looking more towards the hydraulic modeling realm. And also level of detail and desired outputs. So if you're interested in inundation extents or arrival times, hydraulic models are gonna be your best bets to determine those, those outputs. As a quick example, here's an example of hydrologic and hydraulic models being used in tandem with one another. So this is a screenshot of the upper Susquehanna River watershed in New York and Pennsylvania in the US within the core water management system that we use within the Army Corps of Engineers to manage our water management projects. I guess I've managed a whole bunch of times in there, but either way. So in this watershed, we have two USACE owned and operated projects that are in working in tandem to reduce flooding risk to populated areas. So we run hydrologic simulations on a daily basis to forecast inflow hydrographs to both these dams as well as hydrographs for downstream areas. So this is done within our hydrologic model due to time constraints, desired level of accuracy, and desired outputs that we need. But hydraulic simulations are computed only when necessary, usually when stages approach or exceed some defined flood threshold downstream in populated areas. This is done because the hydrologic, sim or hydraulic simulations take longer to complete and inundation extents. They're not always required during normal operations. So we hand output from one to the other uh, using our data storage system, HCDSS, from one model to the other, right? All right, at this point, we're gonna leave the PowerPoint presentation. We're actually gonna do a little bit of demonstration. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open HCHMS. HMS, and I'm gonna begin a brand new project. So I wanna place this project in this location, and I wanna call it Punxsutawney. So if anybody has ever seen the awesome movie Groundhog Day, you'll understand where this place is. If you don't, definitely look it up. It's a great movie to watch. So now that I have a brand new project within HEC HMS, I want to create 
and import a terrain data. So I'm going to give it a name. Let's call it NED 10 meter. NED stands for National Elevation Data Set, and 10 meters is the horizontal resolution. So this data actually covers the entirety of the continental United States. I want to get this data set. So it's a GeoTIFF raster. Now that I've imported that, I can look and see that I have this terrain file that's been imported, and I can now create a basin model. So I'm going to call this basin model punks, just a shorthand name. And I want to associate the previously ingested terrain data. Now I'm going to select it. I'm going to say skip because I just want to transfer the coordinate system from the terrain data. Now that I've done that, you can see my terrain data in the background. And I can begin doing all sorts of things. One of those things being I want to pre-process sinks. So what this is doing is creating a hydrologically corrected DEM, so one that doesn't include artificial pits. You'll see that I've created two new layers. One is a location of all the sinks within the watershed that have been filled, and also a resultant DEM that has been created over that. Next step, I want to pre-process the drainage. What's happening in this process is I'm computing flow directions and flow accumulations. So if you're used to how GeoHMS and or um, Archidro used to work, you know that those are both created as part of that process as well. So let me turn off the flow accumulation raster and show you what the flow direction raster looks like. So this is just computing which way water were to flow and the flow accumulation takes into account everything upstream of that to show you the drainage network. So you can start to see dendritic channels um, and where water would actually flow if it were flowing on the overland plain. So I'm gonna turn that one off and I wanna go back to my base terrain. And now I wanna identify streams. So this is asking for a threshold to say this is a stream or not. And I'm gonna input 70 square kilometers. And now it's gonna determine where enough drainage area has accumulated that exceeds 70 square kilometers, and I'm gonna call that a stream. And now I wanna add a breakpoint. And I'm going to go to a location where a stream gauge exists. So at this location, the United States Geologic Survey is capturing um, essentially stream flow, we'll just call it that, at every single uh, time step. So 15 minute time step in this case, or hourly, depending upon your specific location. Now that I have a breakpoint identified, I can say delineate me these elements. And in very, very short order, I will have created a basin model that contains subbasins and routing reaches. So all these guys are subbasins. These are your catchments where the precipitation runoff process is modeled. And these are stream flow routing reaches where channel routing processes are simulated. Now that I have this stuff, I can start to get specific. For instance, this tributary right here is actually called Stump Creek. So I'm going to rename that subbasin. I'm going to call it Stump Creek. This one is also called East Branch Mahoning Creek. So I'm going to simplify that. I'm going to call it East Branch Mahoning Creek. And I also want to merge these guys together. So I just want to make one single subbasin here. So I select those two. I'm going to merge those elements. I'm going to select those two. I want to merge those elements. And now I can rename this guy. So this is actually Mahoning Creek. And I want to make another junction right here. And I'm going to call this confluence. And I want to connect these subbasins to that junction. So I can rename or re-select their downstream linkage. And now that they're selected, I can also select downstream here for reach two. And finally, I want to select these two routing reach elements and I want to merge them together. I should say one more thing. I want to rename this guy and I want to call that sync gauge. And one more thing, I lied again. I'm going to call this Mahoning Creek, and I'm going to give it an R1 designation to mean reach. So in one fell swoop, well, one, a couple swoops, I have created a complete basin model um, and discretized everything that goes on in here. One last step, I want to create a grid region, and I want to call this SHG, which stands for Standard Hydrologic Grid, which is the option here. We'll see what happens with this one in the next uh, step. I'm going to click finish and I'm going to set that as the default grid region. All right, I'll kick it over to Tommy. All right, so now that Mike's created a basin model, I'm going to prepare a meteorologic boundary condition so we can dump some precip on this basin and we're also going to apply some temperature. So we're going to do a short continuous simulation. 
To import gridded uh, precipitation data, we have this Vortex import utility. So this is a standalone set of small utilities. It's kind of a test bed for features that we'll probably incorporate into HMS in the future. But for now, we have this little wizard and you'll see it's pretty easy to use. I'm gonna select these grid files. The metadata importer, all it does is it reads common gridded data formats, one of which is grid, netcdf is another, hdf5 is another you might be familiar with. So we'll just select all of these files. And now the program's just gonna loop over the files and take a look inside and see what variable is in there. So right now I'm importing MRMS data. It's a pretty uh, good data set for North America. If you're not in North America, you might look out to some other data sources, see what, uh, what is available in your neck of the woods. Um, another one that you might consider using is NASA's GPM data. So I'm gonna select that variable. And now I have the option to clip these grids to my basin. And so right here, I just have a shape file that is my basin extent. I'm also going to set the projection, uh, the target projection for the grids. I want these to be an SHG. If you're working in HMS, I would so strongly suggest using UTM or SHG if you're working in the States, but you can use any projection you want. I'm just suggesting these. And then I'm going to select a target cell size. So that's going to be, I'm going to use a cell size of 2000. And now we just need to say, where do I want to write these grids? We're going to write these to HEC DSS, which is the data storage format that all HEC tools use. So I have an empty DSS file. I'm just going to tell the grids to, to write there. So these grids are going to, it's quite a bit of data to churn through. So each grid, it's going to go through, read the data. It's going to clip it, reproject it, resample it, and then write it. So this will take a minute. I've already created some grids, so we'll just move forward with the grids that I've created and then we'll come back around at the end and take a look at some of the data. So what I'm going to do now is add gridded data. So I'm gonna add a precipitation grid set. I'm gonna name this QPE. That's the data we're using. Now I'm going to link the DSS file that's associated with this. So I've linked the DSS file, now I just need to link a DSS path. You can select any, but I usually go with the first. So I've linked the precip data. Now I'm gonna create a temperature grid. I'm gonna name this RTMA, that's the temperature data that I'm using. Now I'm gonna link the DSS file. And I'm gonna select a record. Okay, now that I've added my data, I'm going to create a meteorologic model. So to do that, I do components, met model manager, and create a new met model. I'm gonna name this September 2018. So now in this model, I have the opportunity to select the different methods that I wanna use. So one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use gridded precip. Another thing I'm going to do is use gridded Hammond evapotranspiration. Now in this gridded precipitation method, I can select my precipitation grids. And in this evapotranspiration method, I can use RTMA temperature grids. Another thing that I'm gonna do with this MET model is link it to the basin model that I'm using. So I'm just gonna tell it to use the sub-basins from the Punxsutawney Basin Model. Okay, I think I have one last thing, and that's to link a gauge here. So I'm gonna bring in stream flow data that's observed. And to do that, I'm gonna create a time series gauge. This is a discharge gauge. And I'm gonna name this USGS Punks for Punxsutawney. So I've added a time series gauge. Now I'm gonna link this to the observed flow record in DSS, something like that. Now I just wanna link this sink. I wanna set this observed gauge. 
So now when we run a simulation, we'll have observed flows to compare to. Okay, so back over to Vortex, we see that our import has completed. So I'll just close the wizard. And now let's take a look inside of DSS. So here's all our records imported into DSS. And if I go to the 9th of September was the most active period. So let's just select a handful of records and then we can graph them. And we start to see that it looks like we have, for this hour, we have 0.4 millimeters in that particular cell. And I'll just step through a couple so you can see what this looks like. So this is, we've created a precipitation boundary condition for our basin. So that's what the data looks like inside of DSS. Great, and now I'm going to quickly parameterize this model. So first things first, I want to set my processes for each subbasin and routing reach element. I want to use deficit and constant losses. And I want to give parameter values for each subbasin of 50 millimeters of initial deficit, maximum storage of 200 millimeters, and a constant loss rate of 2.5 millimeters per hour. I also want to set the canopy method to use the simple canopy method and parameterize that to use an initial storage of 0.1% or 0% and a max storage of 0.1 millimeters, so it's essentially nothing, and simple uptake. So what this will do is allow me to actually extract water from the soil. For transform, I wanna set this to use the modified Clark method and give that parameter six, seven, and eight, nine, 10 values for each individual subbasin, so time of concentration and watershed storage coefficient. For base flow, I want to use the linear reservoir method. So this guarantees conservation of mass. And I want to use two layers for each subbasin. Set the discharge, the initial type to discharge per area. Initially have zero coming out of the first layer and 0 0.015 cubic meters per second per square kilometer out of the second layer. 50% of infiltrated water should go to the groundwater one layer and use a coefficient, a routing coefficient of 20 hours. 50% goes to groundwater two with a storage coefficient of 200 hours. That's all I gotta do for that. One more thing, I wanna set my routing reach to use the Muskingum routing method. And I wanna have a K value of 0.5 and a Muskingum X of 0.25 and a number of subreaches of five. Now I wanna create a control specifications for the simulation at hand. I'm gonna call that September 2018. Now I specify that I wanna start on the 1st of September 2018 at 0000, and I wanna end on the 28th of September 2018 at 000 as well in a time step of one hour. I wanna set that to be a computation point. And now I can run, I can create a simulation run. I'm going to call this September 2018. I need to select a basin model, I only have one. I need to select a MET model, I only have one. And I need to select a control specification, I only have one. So those choices are easy. And now I can make a simulation run. First time I run, since I'm using the modified Clark method, it needs to compute time area histograms essentially and travel time indices for each individual subbasin. So that's what this is doing. This will only happen one time. So it needs to do this one time and then never again unless I make modifications to the basin model itself. You'll see subsequent simulations go much, much, much faster. So now that that simulation is complete, I'll kick it back over to Tommy. Okay, so we've ran our first simulation and I think we're about 10, 15 minutes into the demo, so that's pretty quick. Let's take a look at some of the results. So one of the opportunities you have to view results is straight out of this basin map. So I just right clicked on the sink element we have here. And I have the opportunity to view graphical results. So here we see our graphical results not looking bad for our first run. Another type of result we have is a table. So I can go in here and I can view a summary table. And I see things like a peak discharge, a volume. I can change the units on this. 
I also see things like a Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, so 0.95. Hey, we can just stop now. That's pretty good. Uh, percent bias, so that gives an indication of volume. So we have some performance metrics in these standard summary tables. Another way I can access the results is from the results tab. So I've just switched from the components tab, which is uh, an outline of the watershed. And now I have results here on this tab. So I can just start to click through element nodes and view different types of results. So here's just the results for East Branch Mahoning Creek. And if I scroll down, we can go back to our gauge and access the same results that we just saw from the basin map. Let's keep this here for a second and do a brief uh, run at calibration. So one of the things I might change here, you can see um, my peak is a little low. So one thing I might do is go in, what I'm gonna do is go to back to the components tab, select the basin model node, and now I'm gonna globally edit my loss parameters. So one of the things I can do here is I can start to change my loss rates. So let's go with something Sorry, that's initial deficit. <laughs> um, here we go, this is what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna bump these to 2.75. That's the wrong way, 2.25. Okay, and then I can go ahead and compute from this menu. See what my graph looks like. Okay, now my peak's looking a little better. Another thing I might wanna do is bring my base flow, uh, focus on the recession limb and edit my base flow parameters. So I'll just globally edit those as well. I'll try groundwater one coefficient of 30 here. And a groundwater two, let's try 250. Okay, let's compute that. And then let's take a look. Okay, so now my recession limbs look a little better, but I'm missing on peak flow. So this is calibration. We're going through, we're iterating, we're calibrating the model. So one last thing I'll do is, these are, these. Watersheds have some urban area, so I'll go ahead and add a little bit impervious area in them, and that'll likely bump up our peak. Okay, so we've gotten a little closer on our peak. And this just demonstrates the iterative process of calibration and how you might go about it. I would probably work on this some more, but for the sake of time, we'll keep moving. So let's jump back into the slide presentation. Great, thank you, Tommy. So hopefully you guys saw how fast you could build a model, parameterize it, input boundary conditions, simulate and calibrate you know, you can always keep working on calibration until the end of time, right? But you can see how fast you can do all that stuff within HMS. Hopefully, you guys get a lot of benefit out of that and can uh, get a whole lot of bang for your buck in using this uh, software application in, in your day-to-day -day life, in your job, however. Um, now we're gonna talk about some future enhancements that are planned for inclusion within HMS, within future versions. So first and foremost, everybody's favorite, uh, we want to include the 2D flow, Overland Flow Solver, uh, specifically from HTC RAS, for use within highly detailed studies where unihydrograph transform isn't going to work for you. That's planned for future inclusion. We also have simple reservoir operations that are planned for inclusion within future re releases of HMS. So for instance, I might want to simulate gated operations at a flood control reservoir. So in this uh, simulation here, I'm showing results, uh, the natural flow in the dashed red line, um, that is coming into the project and what I'm actually putting out of the project is in blue and That's realized through gated operations through so some logic within HMS would actually allow us to compute That blue hydrograph given the inflow in red uh, to minimize damages downstream 
So another thing we're planning to work on is parameter estimation. So we recently added a lot of these GIS features and the next step is to do things like import a soils uh, database and start to analyze those databases and make it easier for the modelers to quickly parameterize their models. So this is just an example where someone's imported a soil database. We've done some processing on it to come up with a notion of what the constant rate parameters, loss parameters might be. Another area for future work is metadata processing. So I showed you Vortex and how we built a meteorologic boundary condition based on gridded data. And we plan to continue working with Vortex and building out that functionality. Like I said, a lot of it will potentially be moved into HMS as it matures and develops. The biggest thing we need right now is people to test it with their data sets, let us know how it goes. This is actually an open source project and it's available on the Hydrologic Engineering Center's GitHub page. So if you wanna go there, you can download it, test it. Let me know how it goes. If you're inclined, you can even go help develop on it. Finally, uh, we wanna make improvements to the existing uh, optimization and uncertainty analysis within HSC HMS. So within the current release, you have access to the Markov Chain Monte Carlo optimization um, trial and that can be linked to an uncertainty analysis to investigate the uncertainty in say flow or stage at a specific location solely due to parameter uncertainty. Specifically, we want to make further reductions in run times to make things faster since we have to run potentially millions of simulations to do this. We also wanna add new objective functions to evaluate goodness of fit. We also wanna improve the control of output variables to minimize disk space that we need to take up. So with that, I'll say thank you for your time. For more information, you can visit the Hydrologic Engineering Center's webpage. We have the HMS page. That's a good place to start. You, from there, you can find downloads and documentation. And then I wanna just point at some of the training materials we publish. So every time we put on a class, we'll publish some of the training materials and you might find that helpful to get started on your projects. So thank you everybody for spending the time again. Truly, truly appreciate the opportunity to present HSC HMS to you all. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Michael. It's, it's been a total feast. Um, simulating hydrologic processes, it's been fantastic. We can see the, the enormous amount of experience behind it. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And your, uh, I, I haven't broken into the, 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 um, the presentation simply because it was just so gripping and engaging. And it was good to get the whole picture. Uh, Craig, can I hand back to you? And sorry, but that went, that went dead. What, what chances are there that, that, that an outage should happen right in the two minutes when you're doing, doing a presentation? I know, exactly, exactly. Can you hear me okay now, though? Very clear. Very clear. Okay, All good. good. Um, it's, it's back on. Yeah, somebody at the street cut the power right in the middle of my talk. So that, that's fine. Um, I, I saw think, you coming. Uh, and right. <laughs> Stop him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So um, hopefully uh, um, uh, Joel will work his magic on trimming up the video for, uh, for YouTube uh, viewers. But yeah, that, I, I get, get, get to see most of that um, and very interesting. I've been trying to answer as many questions as we can. Um, there are a few actually still on there that um, uh, Steve and I are still getting to. So Tom and Michael, feel free to uh, pop in there and uh, hit the Q&A as well while we're in the session live. You could also have a look at some of the text ones. We'll, we'll try to address a few of those. And, um, and I think a lot of the questions that were coming in, um, as the questions came in, you guys covered that um, as far as the, the future work. So, so all right, um, let's we can probably dive right into those. Let's, let's do it. I'll, 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 the way we'll do this, I'll read them out because the recording doesn't actually see the questions. If, I, if we pick the questions that are being upvoted, I'll read them out and we can get stuck into them. Uh, before I start, um, you can see how many people are on this webinar across the world. It's going to be a fairly full class. There's only 30, so I'm not doing a big sell here, but I probably am. But, um, but if you want to get in on this course, then uh, I can only say start registering um, as, as soon as the webinar finishes, jump into it. I think, uh, Joel, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Joel's put a registration up on the uh, chat line there. You'll see everybody. Uh, Steve, Steve and Craig will be running that course, but uh, with Tom and Michael's backing, it's been fantastic. Let's get going. Uh, first question from Professor Francisco in Mexico. Is there any perspective to the H HEC HMS to be an open source in future? And is there any risk that it won't be available for free in the future? Good question. Okay, so <laughs> this is, a. Uh, I guess I can speak to that. I don't see HMS being open source in the new, near future. I do seeing it being free uh, 
for the for, foreseeable for the f- foreseeable future. Right. So one of the most difficult things working here is yeah, we're we're tied in with DOD. There's some restrictions there, but there's also just our capacity at HEC. A lot of people think we're this big software development firm of 300 or a thousand, but it's really the HMS team is five to six people, I would say. And so open source is great. And, and pro- little projects like Vortex are open source. So we, we're open sourcing bits and pieces. But the ability to manage a full open source project, I, I, we would truly need more bodies to, to appropriately manage that. But yeah, for the foreseeable future, HMS is free. It's been kind of one of the founding principles is to distribute the free software. So, yep, yep. that's great. You crack a lot of, uh, you, 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 you hit well above your weight with only half a dozen people. Everybody's very keen about it. Uh, right, shall we go on? The next question uh, to hear is asked, what's the difference, difference between heck what, heck HMS, those two, and applications of heck what versus heck HMS? Who wants to take that one on? So HEC Watt, thank you. This is an awesome question, and this is very, very cool. My buddy Will will definitely love this, who's the team lead of HEC Watt. HEC Watt stands for the Watershed Analysis Tool. Um, So this is actually one of our integration pieces of software. So you saw earlier a slide where I included a um, screen capture from our core water management system, SWIMS. This is very similar to that, but for a planning mode. So HEC Watt allows for the integration of HEC HMS, HEC ResSim, HEC RAS, and HEC FIA to do the full uh, analysis suite of hydrologic simulation, reservoir analysis simulation, um, hydraulic simulation, and consequences estimation as well, all in one fell swoop. So HEC Watt allows you to do not just deterministic computes where you know exactly what everything is, but also stochastic computes. So we can sample from the uncertainty space for parameter inputs, for boundary conditions and also fully analyze uncertainty uh, all the way through to consequences. So that is a very, very cool question. HEC HMS is a component model of HEC Watt uh, or can be a component model of HEC Watt. Awesome question. Uh, thanks a lot. And thanks for that question here. Uh, where do we go next, Cray, with these questions? What do you think, uh, Jal, first um, question? Yeah, well, the, uh, one, one question that seems to have come up in a couple of different forms and uh, uh, this this is one that I think you guys will have a standard answer for when is uh, 4.4 coming out uh, and and I know uh, you know on, on, on the heck raz side um, Gary always tells us not to not to even ask and even if he answers don't quote him on it so um, yeah when might 4.4 be expected yeah so if you want to get your hands on 4.4 today and te- help us test it, we have a beta testing program. So the way to do that will be to email the HMS inbox. You can find it on the HMS webpage. I would try to say it, but I uh, wouldn't quote me on it. I believe it's HMS at USAC.army.mil, but it could be right. HMS. Anyhow, find that email, send an email to that requesting 4.4 beta. Uh, that'll eventually get to me one way or another. And then I will send you a non-disclosure agreement, which just kind of tells you what's appropriate for testing the beta software. Like don't do any official studies with this because it's not officially released, things like that. And if you agree to the non-disclosure agreement, we send you the test software and you can start to test with it. Uh, formal release is hard to say. Like Cray mentioned, Gary's Gary's very dodgy about putting down firm dates, and we've learned that in the software development world. Uh, you can never be too sure. So I I yeah I would anticipate. Uh, how as can I say this we, generally? As soon as we can. As soon as we can. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. Right, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Well, Jalfa's question is: Can the hydrologically corrected data be imported from Arc Map? Who wants to take that one on? Yes, so we do have plans for that. Please view these GIS tools as alpha versions, right? So this is our first rollout of integrating GIS functionality in a holistic sense within HMS. We are going to make things better in the future. We're going to continue to make improvements. So if you have suggestions like this or things that you wish it would do, chances are we probably are going after that in the future, but we would love to hear from you. Yeah. So please I'll, send that to the HMS inbox as well. Um, yeah. We'll keep that in mind going forward. I'll add to what Mike says with the, so uh, on the meteorologic side, all of those DSS records, we have the ability, there's a uh, Vortex utility to export those MET records to GeoTIFF. So you can export to GeoTIFF and view in any GIS. 
The GIS features in HMS, those live in a SQLite database inside of the project folder. So if you poke around in there, you can find the SQLite database. You probably have trouble viewing those. You have to do some special importing steps to view those in Esri products. If you're using QGIS, you can drag and drop and they open right there. Well, should we keep moving? Yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a few. I, I, th we're not going to be able to get through all of no. these. So, um, Mike and uh, <laughs> and and Tommy, um, if you want to, again, just if you see any of these on there that you could uh, answer quickly or wanted to highlight, just have a have a brief look at it because we we need to kind of pick and choose which ones to um, to handle. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have asked about the integration with HECRAS, um, which I think you've already covered um, and uh, when, when that might be happening. Uh, one, one that I thought um, might be worth uh, covering now, the, the, an API for uh, web applications. Is, there, um, is, is that something that's on the horizon? Yeah, I'll talk about API a little bit. That is on the horizon. I guess I should clarify too, all of the HMS development, you know, a lot of people think, oh, we're US government, we get a big pot of money and we go to town with it, which isn't actually the case. We work closely with development partners who have specific goals in mind. And so we usually partner with them through things like memorandums of mem MOUs, memorandum of understanding. So that's how we partnered with uh, other countries and things like that. So the API, we actually have a few development partners that are keen on this technology uh, and this, uh, this capability. We've had a uh, kind of a coarse, unpublished API in the past. So that functionality is there. There's some basic documentation in the user's manual. But one of the things that we'll be working on in this next week, actually today is the, the beginning of our fiscal year. So we just kind of reset the books and we're working on new features. And so one of the things we have on tap for this next fiscal year is that API. So if it's not in, it, it likely won't be in 4.4, but uh, in subsequent releases, you'll probably see some basic API functionality. And with that, most importantly, is the documentation on how to interact with the API. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I guess, um, Trevor, I'll just uh, keep having a look at some so. of these ones so. here um, and, and just kind of group them into, uh, into groups. And again, feel free, um, Steve or uh, Mike or Tommy to, to answer these. But uh, again, uh, th those who are not on this session live and will be watching on, on YouTube um, won't see these questions. Yeah. So we can, uh, we can kind of uh, handle, uh, handle this one um, live so that they can see the, uh, hear the answers right now. Um, uh, does HEC have a tool for rainfall disaggregation? Um, that's, I think, I think you may have covered part of that, but um, want to address that? Uh, yeah, so uh, you can do that with an HMS. So you can input a daily time series of precipitation and run at a one minute time step, if you would like, is the smallest time step that you can use. However, um, that's still not going to apply a specific pattern. So it's just going to interpolate from there. So if you were specifically asking if you can apply a pattern to that, um, that is something that we haven't quite done yet, though that is a great question and a great thing to tackle in the future. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of things coming up uh, in, the, in the future that, um, uh, that, that we could look forward to. Um, we may be looking well into the future for some of these questions that have come up about the integration. Some people have asked, um, are we going to be able to get this to run together with groundwater and with sediment transport um, and, you know, sediment yield? And I would love to have a grand unified model where I can just uh, open it up and in one fell swoop uh, get everything modeled all at once. Um, for now, I think we're still going to be stuck with different models and using boundary conditions from one uh, to feed into the other and, and quite a manual process. Um, and, you know, in the end, we are stuck with models and all these models are wrong. Um, maybe I'll cover a, a, a quick one minute of what was going to go into my intro real yeah. quick because mm -hmm. I, uh, I put I brought some toys along here as well um, to show. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll share my screen real quick just to show you what these uh, some of these other models might be. Um, hopefully, um, I, I hate to do this during the Q&A part, um, but uh, the question has come up a, a number of times. Are you able to see my screen there? We again? can. Absolutely. Okay. Brilliant. Yep. Um, this is where we left off with the prequel, and I will just uh, go heading back in time and covering the integration between HEC HMS and HEC RAS. That question came up a few times, and just realizing that hydrology, when we're doing um, you know the quantification of the flow and getting these hydrographs and the characterization of that flow in a hydraulic model, that there is a bunch of overlap. Um, what comes into the hydrological models um, has to be routed using open channel flow methods, and now with HEC RAS and other software, you can use rain on grid 
and use that as a hydrological tool. But they ought to be calibrated against each other um, just so that you get reasonable results um, even when you're using these rain on grid results. Now a, a model itself, um, this guy is not the model, he's got a model here that uh, you can see. Um, I've got a few of these as well um, in, in front of me that I use as classroom tools and um, in, in some of these ones um, I, I guess I just wanted to show you a couple of these um, as, as, as kind of video displays and I'll, I'll put some of these up. Uh, and, and you, you, can, you can actually have your fifth grade project um, if you want, looking for a science project. Uh, th this is actually a very easy one. Um, you drop the rain in and uh, you have a quantity of rainfall going in and you see what the runoff is coming out. And a lot of these models are used as uh, examples of how much sediment comes out. And I wish we could do that all at once and uh, determine all the sediment yield and the sediment transport and the scour. Um, but for now, it's, it's uh, kind of different, different models. Um, but what I wanted to do here is just again show you a couple of my, uh, the ones that um, th that I've got here. I'll, I'll just um, stop sharing my screen here. Um, I'm just losing um, your face a bit there, Craig. Oh yeah, I'm I'm going to actually point this down now and show you the ones that I've got here, um, just so that we can get the difference between uh, heck heck as a rainfall uh, a rain on grid model and um, and uh, the, the heck HMS. And so I don't know if you can see this thing right here. Yeah. I always use these toys. Um, I'm gonna have this digital elevation model that I'll build a little river and watershed into. That's what you're, you've got in a rain on grid model. What I do in these ones then is put that into my basin right here and I overlay it with a computational grid, which I'm gonna put right over the top of it. And that computational grid then will get rain on every single one of these grids. So I've got this little toy that I use here, which got these syringes. And as yeah. I push this thing down, um, right now in HECRAS, you can change the tempo of this. I can push down fast and push down slow and squirt water into each one of these grids. I can't as yet change the temporal pattern and push one, get a storm moving one direction or another. That's coming in the next version. But what we've got then with rain going on every single one of these grids in HECRAS, um, compare that to HMS, which is like those bottle models that I showed you, and I'll put those up here as well. When you drop water into this uh, dirt, basically you have dirt and water coming together, and you measure how much is coming out, we're quantifying the flow going in, and we're quantifying the flow going out based on these parameters, the soil losses, uh, curve numbers, um, infiltration rates, and uh, uh, runoff coefficients. This, this is mathematically based versus a rain on grid model, which many of you have attended those um, rain on grid um, webinars in the past. Um, that is just looking at the topography and we try to slow the, uh, slow the water down with roughness and we try to do all these things that don't quite simulate the same thing. You can get the same results out. You can calibrate them to be giving you the same results, but they're two completely different physical mechanisms. And having these models talk to each other is a very challenging process, but you can do it either way. You can do it as rain on grid or you can do it as a rainfall runoff routing uh, model um, and you can get results out. But what we need to realize is we don't actually know the results. The, the, those results are, are the, the uncertainties that go into the rainfall and the uncertainties that come out of what's going on in the soil are still very, very great. And so we're getting better and better at modeling it and getting these temporal patterns and spatial, spatially variable um, uh, uh, patterns coming in from radar data and everything else. But there still is a lot of uncertainty in these models. And calibration data is key, absolutely key. When you're working in an area that has no calibration data. Just remember your model is probably wrong. It actually is wrong. And, uh, you know, we, we, we do our best to get it as right as we can, but it's never going to be absolute. So anyway, that was my lengthy little explanation on a few of these questions that I've already, already answered that were between uh, comparing rain on grid in uh, HECRAS versus um, rainfall runoff uh, modeling in HMS. And uh, obviously Mark, uh, Mike, Mike and Tommy have done a much better job of explaining the HMS piece of that. But for our HECRAS fans who have uh, tuned in on this one, I just wanted to make sure we highlighted those differences. I think so, it's um, crucial. Questions can, that, um, can oh, I, go ahead, can uh, I make some comments? Yeah. Uh, I'll make some comments, yep. Steve. Here. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, been a great explanation from uh, Michael and Tom, and really top end. A lot of the work I do is a lot simpler than that. A lot of small projects, a lot of flood studies, and when I do my course, live courses, as I will do in the webinar uh, in the in the future course, 
we'll really get down to basics and keep things simple. So you can build up from, you know, two plus one plus one equals two, and two plus two equals four, and and what we've seen this this um, this morning or this evening, depending on where you are in the world, um, we can you can see the potential of what it can do when you've got the technology and data. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the data, it's going to be very hard to build the models. But I can build a lot of models and get quite good um, flows to put into, for example, an ECRAS model that will um, enable you to do very easy jobs very quickly. And um, I know that Michael and Tom like to do the big projects, um, massive square kilometers where for a lot of engineers, and I could be wrong, I could be it in the wrong place here, are dealing with very small catchments, trying to design pipe systems, trying to understand flooding of streams where they're building um, commercial properties, for example. So my comment is I'm, I'll pare it down to be a lot easier for people to understand when it comes to the course. <laughs> yep. No, that sounds great. Uh, and look, um, we're going to have to wrap this up here. We've just hit the hour mark and it's been wonderful having your time, gentlemen, and everyone on board uh, uh, with all your questions. We haven't uh, hit all of them. I understand that. Um, uh, but uh, I do appreciate that we've got the high science, we've got the high modelling and we've got the high practice. Uh, and the stuff you were showing just a moment ago, Craig, just makes it so so uh, obvious to everyone. And and like you say, Steve, um, it's the it's the large, uh, broad area, uh, right through to the smaller um, acreages. You know that that need to be um, uh, managed here. Uh, look, why don't we have a a, a a quick go round of a last word from each one uh, on this topic? Then we'll uh, close down the webinar, and I'll invite um, uh, each one of you now just to have a bit of a, a, a one sentence, two sentence um, wrap up. Um, who wants to kick off? Uh, well, maybe we'll kick off with our guests, uh, Michael and Tom. Okay. Yeah, I'd just like to say thanks for this opportunity. And I'm enthused when modelers and users do really cool stuff. So if you do cool stuff, uh, let us know about it, send it to us, and feel free to reach out and contact us uh, if you have any questions with the software, uh, anything like that. Yep. Yeah. Michael. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss today. I'm just Super, super happy to see everybody from around the world. It's always so flattering and awesome to see people using uh, our software all over the place and all over the world. Please send us your use cases. Let us know how you're using it. Yep, and yourself, Steve. Me next? Yep. Okay, um, no, it's been really good. Got to remember as a modeler that um, EKHMS, like any tool, is only a tool. And you've always got to have your backup. We're engineers or scientists. We've always got to know and understand what we're doing. We don't throw numbers in. And um, it's a great way of doing, like I say, I use it every day practically. And it's a great way of producing some hydrographs and volumes of discharge into basins, etc. cetera. Mm. And, um, but you've always got to have a backup. You've always got to understand what you're doing. I like that. It takes the dark art out of it. It's not a black box. It's actually got real data and it's got to, you've got to have yeah. real ground, tr ground truthing. Uh, and yourself, Cray? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't want to take too much more time, Just, uh, but I don't want to leave anybody hanging. Everybody who's got these questions answer, uh, asked here, um, even those yeah. who that have been answered and uh, dismissed, um, if we can just collect those and then have, give we'll Tom and Michael a chance to weigh in on those, and then we can respond individually. So we don't want to leave anybody hanging. If you asked a question, uh, we do have it recorded we, um, on our end, and so we'll make sure we get you taken care of. I'll, sh so, I'll shoot, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll that, shoot that, those. If over. you're able to do that, that'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah. No, thank, thank you for that. That's, that's been really good. Good gentlemen, um, and uh, as Craig just said, I'll I'll, I'll uh, collate those questions and shoot them out to every one of the presenters, uh, so you will hear from us. Uh, well, thanks for participating. This there's feedback going to appear in a moment uh, on your screen. Uh, the recording will email to you. Uh, there's the, three, the the webinars coming up in the next four weeks uh, and online courses. Please please do join us for the. Um, uh, the uh, HEC HMS course coming up in November. There's also one, as you can see there in October, on HEC RAS and other, others there. I won't go through each one. Go to our website, go look on the YouTube, and you'll have all the details. Once again, Tom, Michael, Steve, Cray, it's been a feast. It's been a fantastic hour. I wish you could go on for another two or three. It's absolutely brilliant. Appreciate all your efforts and time. So for now, it'll be a goodbye to yourselves and to everybody watching here today. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. 
For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au.